Hi guys, hope you're all doing all right, keeping well, keeping safe, all that jazz, not getting too stressed. Um, so Steve and I aren't going to be in, in at King's, doing problem classes, but we will put up solutions, uh, kind of example type solutions for the problems, going through them, talking through them, that kind of thing. Um, I think our current feeling is that that's probably going to be more useful than trying to do some sort of group online study session. You're still welcome to email us with questions, of course, as before, but hopefully seeing these work solutions will be will be the most useful thing that we can do. Do let us know, email me after this has come out to let me know whether this is useful, if there's anything I could do to change it or something different for Steve for next week. We want to try and make this as useful as possible. So let's do this week's questions. So first question, a particle is trapped in an infinite potential world given by v of x is equal to zero at x between zero and l and v of x being infinite at x less than zero or greater than l. So the first thing you do always before even actually trying to do any maths is you draw a little sketch. And the reason that you do this is because you are much less likely to make stupid mistakes in your maths if you draw a sketch. So this is the kind of picture that I have then in my head. This uh, would be zero, this would be L, this would be the x-axis, and up here we have what, what V is doing, and these are going off to infinity. So this is V going to infinity here and here. So these regions are kind of shaded off. If we have infinite potential here, that means our particle definitely can't be in these regions. So our particle is going to be constrained in the 0 to L region in the middle. So this is the square well. This is the case of the square well. And I'll say it again because that potential is infinite in those regions, the regions x less than 0 and x greater than L, there's going to be no particle. So x less than 0, x greater than L, uh, v goes to infinity, therefore no particle. But we need to remember that we're doing kind of rudimentary quantum mechanics here, which means we're not really talking about particles, we should be talking about wave functions. So what does no particle corresponds to? It corresponds to the wave function in the regions x greater than zero and, sorry, that should be x less than zero x less than zero, because that's one of the infinite potential world regions there on the left, and x greater than L, that's the infinite potential region on the right, the wave function is going to have to be zero, i.e. there's zero probability of finding a particle there. Okay, so we have our picture, that's good. And now we can actually think about the question. So A, inserting the wave function for standing waves, and then it gives us the wave function, and there's the integer n there. We can see that it's going to be a positive integer, 1, 2, 3, and so on. So it's, it's non-negative and non-zero. So inserting that wave function into the time-independent Schrodinger equation show that the energy levels are this thing. So show that question is always good because you know what you're working towards. That makes life a lot easier. You've been given the answer. So we have a wave function. And the wave function looked like this. We had a sine. So a there is just a magnitude. N pi x. Remember, x is our uh, degree of freedom. That could be anything. You know, Your wave function isn't always just a function of position. It could be a function of any relevant system coordinate. So here we had our magnitude. And if we wanted to, we could probably figure out what that magnitude is, because you'll remember that the wave function has to be square, integrable, and finite. Um, well, I say you remember. I think we've said this. We may not have. Um, and if we haven't, it doesn't matter because this is, I know this is a little bit more than you need to know. Um, but I'll explain it to you anyway because it's good to know. So it needs to be 
square integrable and finite. So square integrable means if I take its integral over the entire real line, so I'm doing the integral over the variable, the variable was x, and I integrate the mod square, that has to be finite. So square integrable means this integrable exists, and finite means less than zero, uh, less than infinity, sorry. But in fact, we require this. We require that it be equal to one, exactly equal to one. Why? Because the mod square of the wave function is a probability, and if you add up all possible probabilities, that must be equal to unity. Uh, if you want a physical understanding of what that means, that would mean if we think about our uh, infinite square well that we've considered here, if we're integrating along the real line, the mod square of the wave function, that means we're integrating from x is minus infinity over here, and we're integrating towards x is plus infinity over here. And so we're adding up the wave function everywhere. If you're adding up the probability of it being everywhere, well, it has to be somewhere. It has to exist somewhere. So that means the probability of the particle existing somewhere in all of space is 1. So that's how we know that the mod square, the integral of the mod square, must be 1, which means the wave function is square integrable and finite. So we have our wave function, we have a magnitude, which we don't currently know, and we're going to insert this into the time-independent Schrodinger equation. So let's remind ourselves what the time-independent Schrodinger equation is. Um, we have minus h bar squared on 2m, and then we have the second derivative with respect to space, acting on a wave function, and uh, then there's going to be some potential term, if indeed our system has a potential term, which ours does, it has a potential, it's the infinite, infinite potential square well, and that's going to be equal to the energy of our system, the energy of our wave function, or the particle it describes, also multiplied by the wave function. Now, this can actually be written in another way that will be useful for you in later years. We can write this as what's called an operator. And in fact, the operator that this refers to is called the Hamiltonian. And it's the energy operator. So the Hamiltonian is minus h bar squared on 2m. Second derivative with respect to space plus the potential. And what you do is you apply that operator to the wave function. So you end up with something that looks like Hamiltonian, which just means the left-hand side acting on the wave function is equal to the energy times the wave function. And this, you might recognise, is an eigenvalue problem. It's an eigenvector equation. That's good because there are various methods that are known that you may have learned about or will learn about for solving these kinds of problems. So that's good. Good little thing to know. We can write it in that form and then we can use all the machinery of linear algebra to go about trying to solve it. Anyway, back to what we're doing. We're substituting our wave function into this, this formula here, this time-independent Schrodinger equation. Time-independent because, as you can see, there's no time derivatives. Nothing is a function of time. Let me get a new page. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, it means a couple of things. We clearly have three regions of space where the potential is different. Our potential can do three things. I'll do that little sketch again. So this was at zero, this was at L, this is x, and this is going off to infinity. And we have these three regions. So here we have v is equal to infinity. Here we have v is equal to zero, and here is v equal to infinity again. So our potential function looks like this. It's a three cases function. Infinity, zero, infinity. If x is less than zero, if uh, let's say if 
x is greater than l, and here we can say otherwise. So that's our potential function. Bit of a weird function to try and put into this time-independent Schrodinger equation, if you look at it. Except that we know that if you... Let's say we try and substitute the wave function into the time-independent Schrodinger equation when x is less than 0 or x is greater than L. So one of these two regions here, where the potential is infinite. That would mean that the potential here would be infinite. And if this is infinity, if this v is infinity, that means this e will also have to be infinity. We've got an equal sign. What's on this side has to be equal to what's on this side. And the wave function must be smooth everywhere. It can't be discontinuous, which means this derivative here can't be infinite. So if this cannot be infinite, and this is infinite, then this e must also be infinite. And it doesn't make physical sense to have an infinite energy particle. So that tells us that the wave function does not exist in the regions where the potential is infinite. To write that a little more formally, just to be clear, if we're thinking about x is less than 0 or x is greater than L, the two regions in the infinite potential, and we're substituting in to our time independent Schrodinger equation, this is our v. It has two solutions, two possible solutions to an equation of this form. One would be the energy is infinite, and the other would be that the wave function is equal to zero. Why? Well, the first case I already explained. I said, this is infinite, this cannot be infinite, which means this must also be infinite, because we require the two sides to be equal. So that's this case one. But what else, what other psi might satisfy this time-independent Schrodinger equation with this infinite potential here? Well, another one that would satisfy it would be 0, 0, 0. Having 0 equals 0. Then this 0 would kill this infinity, and everything is still fine. The infinite energy solution is not physical. But the wave function being 0 is physical. If the wave function is 0, that means no probability of finding particle in x less than 0 or x greater than L, which we kind of already knew. We already knew that in these really big potential regions, these massive walls, these infinitely strong walls, that our particle can't be there. We kind of already knew that. So it's good that when we thought about our equation a little bit, we actually saw mathematically that that, that was a solution to the equation and that it makes sense. This tells us, though, that we should substitute psi of x into the time-independent Schrodinger equation for v equals 0 only. So that was for x between 0 and L. So that's where we're going to do our substitution, actually evaluate the time-independent Schrodinger equation. So one more time, writing it down again. We're considering the bit where this is zero, so we can ignore that. Which means we need to do this applied to this. So let's do that. Minus h bar squared on 2m. And then our wave function was a sine n pi x on l. So we do the second derivative. Oh, didn't write down the second derivative. There we go. 
second derivative of that, and then that's going to be equal to V energy times A sine n pi x or an L. Okay. So we need to evaluate this second derivative here. So let's evaluate one of the derivatives. So I'm going to uh, this is the second derivative, that d by dx that I've written out the front. That's the second derivative we're going to need to do. In the brackets, I will write down what happens when we do the first derivative. So you all know how to differentiate. If you don't, you need to. So if you aren't comfortable with basic differentiation, you need to spend a fair amount of time getting comfortable with differentiating polynomials, trigonometric functions, using the trig identities, to differentiate. Um, we'll use a trig identity for uh, the later part of this question actually. Things like the exponential function, logarithms, you need to, that, that stuff is stuff that you need to be able to do without really thinking. So if you struggle with that, now is the time to put some work in and come to chat to me or Steve if you really have to. But if you, if you leave it any later than now to get really good at that stuff, then you're just not going to be able to do the course, do the rest of the course. Okay, derivative of sine is of course cos, and we times by what's inside the brackets. So we're using the chain rule. We have a function of a function. We have sine, which is a function, of a linear function in pi over l times by x which means we get m pi over l up front, because we differentiate the argument. If you differentiate m pi over l times x with respect to x, you just get m pi over l. And then we differentiate the function. If you differentiate sine, you get cos. Now we have to do our second derivative. If you differentiate cos, you get minus sine. And we bring another factor of m pi over l out the front. So we now have an m pi, l, m pi over l all squared. There's a minus sign out the front there, and it's sine m pi x on l. Nice. So what does that give us if we substitute it in? We have a minus sign here and a minus sign here, so they cancel. And we get h bar squared n pi on l squared. We have that 2m divided by 2m. And then we have an a sine n pi x on l. But this bit here is sine, what we started with. And you'll notice that it also occurs here. That's psi that we started with. So what have we arrived at? We've arrived at h bar n pi on, on, oops, on L. This bit all squared, one on two M. Psi x is equal to energy times psi. So what are the solutions to this equation? There's another one where there's two solutions. One solution would be the wave functions equal to zero. If you put psi equal to zero on both sides, clearly zero is equal to zero. So that works. But that's what we would refer to as the trivial solution. Not trivial in the sense that it's easy, trivial in the sense that it doesn't really mean anything. That means there is no wave function. There's no particle. Uh, so physically, it's true. It solves the equation, but it's completely disinteresting. Or there's the second case. And the second case is that the energy, E, has to be equal to 1 on 2m h bar n pi on L all squared.
Nice. So let's just do a little check of how f close are we getting to what we want here. So this is the thing that we want. We want the energy in terms of these constants. So let's go back and see if we can get there. I have E is equal to h bar is equal to 2 pi. So I've got 1 on 2m. Sorry, not h bar is equal to 2 pi. h bar is equal to h on 2 pi. So then I've got h squared on 4 pi squared times n squared pi squared on l squared. I have here 4 times 2, so I've got an 8. Pi squareds cancel, so I've got 8m l squared h squared n squared. Draw attention to this n. Remember, n is an integer, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Which means what we've really got is these n squared multiples of whatever this quantity is. This h squared on 8m l squared. So we can index our energy with n, because for each n, we get in a different a different allowed value. So this then is the answer that we've just arrived at. Let's double check. Is it what we were trying to show? I see an h bar. I see an h squared on eight m l squared. Is that what we wrote down? H squared on eight m l squared. It is. So as required. Good. Very good. A couple of words, though, on what this means, because this actually is quite profound. We started off with something that is fundamentally continuous. Our wave function is a continuous function. It's a field, a function. It exists everywhere in all of space. It has an infinite number of degrees of freedom, because at every point in space there is a number. So that's an infinite number of degrees of freedom, because there's infinite space. And... By putting a potential in there that constrains that function, constrains our wave function, we find that the energy of our system has to be only particular values. It's not continuous. It has jumps. In other words, if we had an energy axis like this and say here's zero energy, then what does this En look like? It looks like this. This would be... Oops, sorry. This would be n is 1, n is 2, n is 3, n is 4. And the gaps between those states would get bigger and bigger because you've got an n squared. So these are going like the square, these gaps. What is this? It's quantized. This is kind of what quantum mechanics means. It's quantized. It's not continuous anymore. And we'll keep seeing that. We'll keep seeing that time and time again with all kinds of quantities. And we'll see that actually it has some quite profound implications on what can be measured and what those measurements mean. Really, it's, it's the fundament, one of the fundamental differences between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics. But that's enough about that. Let's do B. Okay. So now we're going to try and calculate the probability of finding the particle in its ground state, so that's the n is 1 state, within the region 0 to 0 0.25L. So that means our particle is going to be in 0 and L over 4. Or rather, the probability that we find our particle there. So we're asking, what is the probability of finding our particle in this region? So how do we find the probability? Remember that the probability, P of x, of finding a particle in the window, dx, 
is equal to the mod square of the wave function times that uh, little window. Okay, and what this means is the probability of finding the particle in the window that we've been given is the integral from 0 to L over 4 dx, the mod square of the wave function. And we recall that our wave function was A sine n pi x on L. So that means we have A squared times the integral from 0 to L on 4 of sine squared n pi x on L. And this is what we need to integrate. And immediately what I can s this this is when I said you're going to need to use one of those trig identities right now to be able to do this integral. So we need to be able to integrate sine squared. A couple of things. Um, I mean, as soon as I see as, as soon as I see sine squared, it makes me think that sine squared theta plus cos squared theta is equal to one. So I'm probably going to use that at some point. Or from this, I could say that sine squared theta is equal to 1 minus cos squared theta. I also know that cos of A plus B, this is one of the double angle formula, is equal to cos A cos B minus sine A sine B. And if you let a and b be equal to each other, i.e. you say something like cos 2 theta, then you get cos squared theta minus sine squared theta. But if I substitute this line in for sine squared here, I get actually no, that's not what I'm going to do. Sorry. Uh, so as well as sine squared theta equal 1 minus cos squared theta, I can also say cos squared theta is equal to 1 minus sine squared theta. And it's that that I'm going to substitute in. So I get this cos squared becomes 1 minus sine squared theta, and then I've got another minus sine squared theta. So that's 1 minus 2 sine squared theta, which I can rearrange. Sine squared theta, I'm going to add this over to this side, bring the cos 2 theta to the other side and divide by 2, I get half 1 minus cos 2 theta. Nice. Why is this nice? Because while I couldn't directly integrate sine squared, I definitely can integrate cos of 2 theta. That's something that I do know how to integrate. So my probability of x in the region I was given is the integral from 0 to L on 4. We had an a squared out the front, dx sine squared, n by x on L. And this sine squared becomes a half of just pull that out front, 1 minus cos 2n pi x on L. And this I can integrate. That 1 becomes an x. If I've got minus cos, what does that integrate to? Well, sine differentiates to minus cos, so minus cos integrates to sine. So I've got plus sine. And if I were to differentiate, I would be timesing by 2n pi on L. So because I'm integrating, I need to divide by 2n pi on L, which means I get an L on 2n pi. 
sine of 2n pi x on l. Evaluated between 0 and l on 4. And this is where you pause for a second and you do a quick sanity check. Does this differentiate, does this line differentiate to give this line? Well, if I differentiate x, I get 1. And if I differentiate sine, uh, that should be minus. There should be a minus sign here. This is why it's worth doing, because even if you make a little typo, like I just did, if you stop and you do a sanity check, that means that you spot it. So if we differentiate minus sign, we get minus cos. If we integrate minus cos, we get minus sign. Good. And if we differentiate here, then we're going to be timesing by 2n pi on L, which cancels out this L on 2n pi, which gives us exactly what we want. So this is all good. So what have we got then between 0 and L on 4? x evaluated at L on 4 is just L on 4. x evaluated at 0 is just 0. And then we have this bit. Evaluated at L on 4. So that's sine 2n pi on L, L on 4, minus sine of 0. What is sine of 0? It's just 0. We've got here, we've got here sine of the 4s, and the 4 and the 2 just gives us a half, and the L's cancel, so we get n pi on 2. Very nice. But we can do a little better than that, actually, um, because we were told that we were in the ground state. And it's 1. So really, this is sine of pi on 2. Which means pi on 2 is here. So this is equal to 1. So we've got L squared on 2. L on 4 minus L on 2 n pi. And what did we have in the brackets? In the end, it was just equal to 1. So that's that. Very nice. n is equal to 1, of course. Got to remember that, make my life easier. So this was just going to be that then. Is there anything else that we need to do? Calculate the probability. Have we done that? No. Because we actually also have to find this normalization constant. Easy enough to do. We know it. It's our evaluate over the whole real line. Well, the square of the wave function is equal to 1. And we do the same thing. We use all the same trick that we had a second ago. So we're going to get a squared onto real line um, 1 minus cos 2n pi x on L. x minus L on uh, 2 n is equal to 1, so 2 pi sine 2 pi x on L, evaluated from infinity minus infinity. This is clearly 0, and uh, the way that you um, do this bit here would be to say Ah, ah, aha, uh -huh. 
Yes. Again, got caught out there. Have to be a little more careful. Sketch. This is why we do our sketches. Sure, we're normalizing, which means we're integrating from minus infinity to infinity, but we know everywhere here our wave function is zero, and we know everywhere here our wave function is zero. So actually, this line here is incorrect. It's this line we need to change. That integral previously over the real line is actually from 0 to L. x evaluated at L, and then x evaluated at 0 is just 0. Again, this is 0. And what have we got here? Well, L over L is 1, sine of 2 pi. It's happening here, so it's 0 which means we've just got a squared L on 2. But this must be equal to 1, which gives us that. A is equal to 2 on L square rooted. Therefore, our probability, here it is, a squared on 2, L on 4 minus L on 2 pi, two on L, we have that half as well. These twos cancel, these L's cancel, we get a quarter minus 1 on 2 pi. So this is approximately 0 0.25. Pi is about 3, so that's like a sixth. A sixth is almost a fifth, which is about 0 0.2, but it's a bit smaller than that. So 1 sixth. What's that roughly? Well, minus a sixth, approximately. Um, that must be about 0 0.14. About 0 0.16? Yeah. 6 times 16 is nine, is close to 100, so that's good. So it's approximately this, which means it's approximately 0 0.09, i.e. 9% chance of finding the particle in x is in 0 to L on 4. Nice, 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 nice. So just then quickly, are there any final points, any take home points? Do your sketch to start. Helps you not get caught out. Write down the things that you know at the top of the page or at the top of your answer. That's actually really useful for marking. Um, if you write down the things that you know, that tells us what you know, makes it a lot easier for us to award you marks. Time independent Schrodinger equation, you need to memorize that. We substitute it in, 
you looked at possible cases, if it was obvious to you that the wave function had to be zero in the infinite potential regions, then you wouldn't have needed to show, yes, there are two solutions, one is not physical, one is physical. You can just immediately have neglected x less than zero and x greater than L. So we substitute in for the region where the potential is zero. We do the differentiation, um, which brought us to two solutions, a trivial solution, psi being zero, i.e. no particle, and this quantized energy solution, which is what we were looking for. Then we just did some integration and trig. Uh, it was a number crunching exercise, essentially. We had to use double angle, double angle formula and the trig squared formula to rearrange our integrand into something we could do. And then we did the integration and evaluated it in the limits we were given. But we had to remember to find our normalization constant. And the important point there was, which which I had forgotten, right? I had, first of all, tried to integrate over the entire real line and then got stuck because I was trying to integrate sine from plus minus infinity, which, which, which you can do, but you just can't do it in a standard way. So here it wasn't helpful. But of course, I shouldn't have been doing that because psi is zero for anything less, for x less than zero and x greater than L. So I only needed to be evaluating this integral between zero and L. So I found my normalization constant, it was square root 2 on L. I put that into my probability and found that about 9% of the time I would find my particle in the x is 0 to L on 4. Okay, so question 2 is a Jupyter notebook question, it's a, a practicing Python question. I won't do it here um, because we spent quite a lot, a lot of time doing that, doing the question we just did in detail anyway. And there are relatively extensive notes that Jeff has written in the code itself, in the Jupyter Notebook. And really all you have to do is change a couple of values, look at what that does to graphs, that kind of thing. Uh, it's not really a question, it's not really an exercise, it's more an opportunity for you to see how something works. So I, so I won't do that. As I said at the start, please don't hesitate to contact Steve or I and do let me know uh, if you have any feedback on whether this is or isn't useful, uh, if you want us to do something else. Otherwise, stay well, all that jazz. Uh, miss you. you know, it's a shame we're not in doing physics, but uh, I'm sure I'll see you all again soon.